so I wanted to talk about the next phase in uh, Lacasas's uh, life and experience. And so uh, let's go back to the outline. And so after seeking refuge with the Dominicans in Santo Domingo, he flees back to Spain in 1517. Um, now, King Charles is on, Prince Charles is now on the throne, and La Casas works with uh, the Chancellor Jean de la Sauvage, um, which, by all accounts, he seemed to have a pretty good relationship with. Um, and, and throughout this, I mean, La Casas has a very good reputation with the crown. Um, he has a very good uh, political popular presence and he has the ear of the king uh, throughout this time period. So I mean it's it's not as if he's just uh, a voice crying in the wilderness. Uh, he really is getting a hearing and you know he has popular support. Uh, so it's really interesting to look at things from the perspective of La Casas because this is right at the beginning of, of Spanish colonialism and it's apparent to the Spanish themselves that there is something deeply wrong here. There's something immoral going on. Uh, so let, let, let's keep that in mind. Um, so Sauvage uh, is, is working with him closely. Um, they have a new plan that he works out with Sauvage to present to the king. And they're going to abolish encomienda. They're going to have self-governing towns of indigenous people. And these are going to be considered as vassal states to the crown, paying tribute in the form of gold or, or whatever resources they have. Uh, directly to the crown, so that that makes uh, the king happy, and uh, they're going to have import, you know, increased importation of African slaves to offset the labor shortage uh, that would be produced by these reforms. Again, because Lacassus understands that the African slaves are slave legally slaves um, through the you know the machinations that I've already discussed and uh, he promotes a form of peaceful colonization where we take uh, Spanish campesinos uh, peasants from Spain and use them as colonists like ship them out to the colonies and have them uh, establish homesteads on a small scale farming basis and uh, try to integrate with the indigenous population and convert, you know, because there always is this idea in La Casas's mind of converting the indigenous people to Christianity. And once they rationally and of their own volition convert to Christianity, then they can very easily become subjects uh, in their own minds. Uh, you know, officially they're already subjects of the Spanish crown, but then they can be fully integrated into Spanish culture uh, once they are, once they are uh, converted by peasant campesino colonist who will show them the grand Christian way of living, how better it is to, to the indigenous way of living. You know, this is in La Casas's mind, uh, you know. Um, so part of this plan was to recruit a bunch of campesinos from Spain and have them become colonists. And, and they did, uh, La Casas worked diligently to actually gather a, a 
a good number of campesinos for this purpose. Uh, but in the after, you know, getting a lot of people on board with this whole plan, Sauvage dies right in the middle of the process. It's like this is kind of a running theme, <laughs> and um, and so in the end, uh, Lacassus's plan is not well supported by the crown because he doesn't have the backing of Sauvage anymore. And he has to reduce the number of campesinos that he's taking out as colonists, and they're not well supported in terms of money and provisions. So, um, so ultimately, this ends in fa failure. Now, all uh, about this time, um, the Protestant Reformation is kicking off. Uh, Martin Luther. You know, we know Martin Luther King Jr. from the 1960s. He's named after Martin Luther from the 16th century, from the 1500s. Uh, and Martin Luther is the figurehead of the Protestant Reformation, the, the protesters against Roman Catholicism at this time in the tradition of John Hus and John Wycliffe uh, that I discussed in, in earlier videos. And, um, but with the situation as it was and at this later date, it really turns into a full scale uh, war, uh, a continental war waged in small conflicts all over Europe in a, just a mishmash crazy chaotic um, uh, uh, somewhat of a civil war so it's, it's very much like a civil war um, a little more organized or, or a little more I would say maybe even less organized than a civil war because it, it was like county by county um, very chaotic very bloody uh, very traumatic. So this, this traumatic war is, is beginning to brew in the background. It really doesn't take off until the 1530s, but it's starting to happen even at this time. Um, at the same time, the rebellion of the Taino tribe in Hispaniola, uh, modern day Dominican Republic in Haiti, there's a the indigenous one of the larger indigenous tribes is the Taino tribe and there's Enrico, um, the leader of of this tribe, who uh, wages a war for like a decade, um, from 1519 to 1533, actually, more than a decade, and. Um, it's quite disruptive because this is the seat, this is, Santo Domingo is on this island, which is the seat of government for the entire, uh, you know, so-called New World, and uh, so that's going on. Diego Columbus, uh, his governorship is restored by Charles, um, who is now Holy Roman Emperor uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, based in. Germany, but he rules it from Spain, and um, that's in 1520. In part, it seems because uh, the new governorships that that came uh, earlier, you, you know, after Lacassus's uh, call for reforms and everything, uh, were seen as not effective, and so Diego comes back to like restore like some kind of old order. Um, and so along the plans of this this earlier uh, plan with Sauvage, in the midst of all this, Lacassus um, presents a new plan to King Charles. Uh, Emperor Charles, and so he he wants an encomienda in northern Venezuela. 
that stretches from Kumana, um, the, the mouth of a river coming out of Venezuela, stretching out to Chiribichi. And let me show you this map here. I think this is still showing, yes, okay. And so this is modern day, but I've marked the map. So this is Kumana and this is Chiribiche. And out here is Hispaniola. And if I was zoom in, just, and there's Santo Domingo. So that's the seat of government for the colonies. And right across uh, the uh, Caribbean Sea is northern Venezuela. And he wants to set up a kingdom based in Cumana and stretching out to Cherubice. It's spelled a little different here. Okay. Um, and there's a Franciscan monastery already previously established at Cumana. So, like, this is a place on the map, and there's a Dominican monastery at Cherubice. So these are these are landmarks, okay. And uh, now the area is harassed by colonists, conquistadors, whatever pirates, kind of conducting slave raids um, out of uh, Cubaga. So there's a small island here, and there's you know conquistadors. Uh, seafaring conquistadors that just are attacking this coast and picking up tribes people and taking them off into slavery and taking them back to Hispaniola. Um, you know, to just enslave them uh, part and parcel. And uh, these conquistador pirates are involved in rum trade so that they, they trade rum for slaves and, um, and are, you know, part of the early functioning of what would later be called the um, uh, slave trade triangle you know, where you take slaves from Africa and bring them to the Caribbean and pick up sugar from the sugar plantations and then take those to North America and that's converted to rum and then you pick up rum and, you know, just create this whole tra trade route where you're trading um, slaves, sugar, and rum. This is kind of the early uh, beginnings of that whole thing, which you may be familiar with. That's kind of a kind of a key feature of m most high school history textbooks. Okay, um, <clears throat> so. Lacasas proposes that uh, tin forts be erected along that, that northern coast of Venezuela to protect the indigenous people from these slave raids. All right, so he's asking Charles to set up forts to protect the indigenous people. You know, so he has some very utopian ideas in the context of this uh, brutal uh, genocidal uh, invasion of the Americas. And he suggests that the indigenous tribes will be organized into vassal states, uh, as before, paying tribute to the crown, in gold and pearls. Now, this is an area where there's a lot of uh, pearl fishing, where people are, are uh, acquiring pearls uh, along this coastline, so it's rich in pearls. And that's part of what uh, those conquistador uh, you know, uh, pirates uh, are doing, which of course becomes part of the whole lore of pirates uh, in later centuries. 
eventually Charles does grant an encomienda to uh, La Casas, but much smaller than what he had requested. Okay. And also the extraction rights of gold and pearls is denied. So he can't set up these vassal states of indigenous people paying tribute to the crown because they can't legally extract the wealth. And so Charles uh, grants him a half measure, but a half measure such that his whole plan is effed, you know, so um, he's kind of set up for failure. And so he sets out in November of 1520. He reaches Puerto Rico by January of 1521. <clears throat> when he reaches there, he's, he finds, oh, the monastery in Cherubici has been sacked by indigenous, um, an indigenous tribe there. And um, Gonzalo de Ocampo <clears throat> is leading retaliatory raids within the encomienda that that de la casas is supposedly the lord of he's has he has his official legal ter territory being invaded and totally disrupting his whole plan so uh la casas goes to hispaniola that's where the that's where the audience, uh, the real audience, uh, the royal audience is, the, the Supreme Court in the colonies is located. So he files a legal complaint there <clears throat> and, you know, goes through months of legal wrangling. And in the meantime, most of his Compensino colonists that he had brought from Spain desert him. Okay, they're like, okay, this this guy doesn't know, like, we're done. We're like, and they probably just are getting work or getting uh, encomiendas of their own, you know, whatever the case may be out there. So he did arrive in late uh, 1521 to Cremana uh, <clears throat> and begins to diligently work on building his plan but he's constantly harassed by the pirates of Cubagua and um, and is rough going. Okay, it's very difficult, especially because of this harassment, because as the conquistador pirates of Cubagua are raiding the indigenous tribes, it's difficult for La Casas to develop relationships with them and say, hey, you know, let's form into cities and let's be part of this imperial government. Like, like they can't distinguish between his peaceful approach and this, this like totally exploitative approach of these uh, conquistador pirates. And so his whole plan is being disrupted by this small band of uh, conquistador pir pirates. Uh, in the midst of this, we have the fall of, uh, fall of Tenochtitlan, uh, which is like Mexico City. Um, uh, Tenochtitlan uh, was the Aztec capital of the Aztec Empire that was covered most of modern day Mexico. Um, Cortez. Uh, as a conquistador comes in and, and, and wipes them out. <clears throat> so the, the empire, the Spanish empire is expanding quite dramatically. Uh, King Charles sets up the council of the Indies <clears throat> in his royal court. So there, now there's a council within his royal court that handles all the business affairs of the Indies. So it's not coming directly to the king. He has like a, a front organization that's holding off all the, the issues. And La Casas returns to Hispaniola in January 1522. So this is not long after he arrives uh, to uh, Cumana, right? So late in 
15 to 21. So just after a number of months, he's like, I got to I got to go back to Hispaniola and uh, try to get some legal uh, redress for this harassment that I'm receiving from these Spanish colonists. And uh, when he arrives, he gets news that Kumana, the, the city where he had established his kingdom and his encomienda, uh, you know, his settlement uh, had been totally sacked by an indigenous tribe. And even La Casas himself is reported as being dead. I and mean, he's like, obviously, he's like, hey, I'm not dead. Um, but um, still, the news is not good. And uh, the colonists, the Encomienderos in Hispaniola, use the news of the sacking of Cumana as propaganda to just more aggressively raid and uh, take slaves on the northern coast of Venezuela. And so his whole project is just totally done. Um, in defeat, Lacasas retreats to the Dominican monastery of Santo Domingo, the capital city of Hispaniola. And he studies the work of Thomas Aquinas, which I discussed earlier. You know, he's the big scholastic Aristotelian of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he becomes a Dominican friar. So now he is part of the Dominicans. Earlier, remember when he was an encomendero back in Hispaniola, he argued against the Dominicans. Now he's converted over to the side of the Dominicans, become a Dominican friar. And um, he's in the monastery. He's staying out of public view. You know, he's, he's totally in isolation from the outside world and protected here. And in this time, he starts to write the history of the Indies. And this is a multi-volume work, a large, large work, uh, so large that uh, it hasn't even been fully translated. I would say maybe a third of it, maybe less. Uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, but I would say definitely less than a third of it has been translated into English. Most of it, and he, of course he wrote it in Latin. Um, and there are Spanish translations that are more extensive, but English translations are, are very scant. Uh, it's a very large work, okay, it's a lot, it's, it's big. Uh, but he begins it in 1527. So he's documenting what he's seen, and, and, and as American scholars, we haven't even seen all of it. Um, during this time, he writes a letter to the Council of the Indies. That's the council set up by King Charles to run things in the Indies, as they call them, the colonies. And, you know, he tries to argue for uh, his 1516 plan, the utopian Thomas More version of things which he kind of consistently throughout is, is, is arguing for, but this is more in line with that 1516 sort of plan. And, um, and, and in the midst of this, you know, the crown does receive complaint that the encomiendero, from the encomienderos that uh, La Casas was accusing them of sin uh, from the pulpit. So La Casas is giving sermons at this point, and he is calling out the encomienderos as slave traders, you know, as, as slave owners. And, um, and of course, they're appealing to, you know, some kind of legal cover that it's some sort of feudal, uh, legal mumbo jumbo business. Uh, but he's calling them out and saying, no, it's just, it's just wrong. Um, you know, so we, we do see this connection here, especially in light of 
my schematic introduction to Marx's political ecology, you know, some people would see feudalism as perfectly legal and perfectly good. Uh, but many people, most Americans, see serfdom as a kind of slavery. Um, but there is an analogy there then to bourgeois production and, you know, factory production of the 19th century. And some people see it as perfectly legal and good. It's good to have six year old boys crawling under machines and getting their arm chopped off. That's good. It's not just legal, it's good. Uh, ordained by God. But there are people who see that as wrong. And De La Casas now kind of stands out as one of these very early historical figures who has this kind of moralistic complaint against the abuse of labor. And this all plays into uh, eventually um, uh, liberation theology. So De La, Cas uh, De La Casas becomes, you know, this this kind of icon of liberation theology because he's right there at the beginning and he's complaining from the beginning, you know, and he was involved in it himself. He's repentant. The reason why he complains so harshly is because he feels guilty for what he has done. Um, all right, and then in the midst of this also, being in Santo Domingo, he facilitates peace between uh, Enriquillo and uh, the Spanish crown and ends the rebellion of the uh, Taino tribe of Hispaniola. So he facilitates all that, and, and that's uh, quite a large accomplishment. Again, uh, La Casas is always like there losing, 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 but then winning, like getting some wins and, and, and establishing his reputation, uh, but losing a lot because he's just like on the wrong side of things because genocide and kleptocracy is the name of the game and, and he's against it. All right. So I'll, I'll leave that there and uh, then pick up with the next video.